Hi, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another session uh, from the Digital Innovation Incubator. And today with us, we have uh, Darko Kreiner. He was the colonel in the US Air Force. So welcome Darko and hello. Welcome to everyone. So I think uh, it would be best uh, if you introduce and say a couple of words about yourself. So feel free to, to share with us. Yes, my father and mother were born here in Slovenia, where I currently live now, and escaped after the Second World War, went to America. When I was 17, I uh, entered the Air Force, joined uh, basic military training, and, uh, and started my career uh, in the United States Air Force. So that lasted for about 32 years, and I went from, uh, from a, uh, um, an airman, we call him, which is basically the lowest possible conceivable rank, the absolute lowest on the food chain, and then just over years, learned leadership principles, served and did my very best. And, uh, and finally, it was able to retire out of the Pentagon. Uh, I was working for the chief of Air Force Logistics. So we were responsible for uh, uh, all of the bases, aircraft munitions, and all logistical uh, considerations for the entire United States Air Force, about a $34 billion operation. And then I was able to uh, retire and then return back here to Slovenia, where I've been currently semi-retired, just lecturing like this and then enjoying life, so. So yeah, obviously you do have a bunch of experience uh, with leadership and, and all of this throughout your career. So uh, could you explain please to us, what does it actually mean to be a leader? That's a good question. And that's something that's been debated uh, from the beginning of time and currently in our leadership schools and university is still being debated to this day. One of the basic questions is, is a leader made or is a leader born? And the reality is, is it's about an 80-20 uh, principle, I think, about 20% you're born with in terms of leadership gifts and attributes and abilities. Uh, and about 80% of it is uh, skills and experience that's acquired and learned over time. Uh, some people learn and, and apply the principles of life. It's, it's very possible to go through life and experience things and not learn from that. So, so being a learning uh, person, a teachable person that's always looking, always studying, always realizes that they don't know it all and are always willing to learn something new. Those are the kind of leaders that develop over time to be very, very effective. So the key to being a leader uh, in, in essence is, is not uh, so much what you accomplish as an individual, but rather what you accomplish through a team. Leadership is, is all about leading teams. Uh, you can be a part of the team and most of us will start as a part of a team. Uh, and what we do physically with our own hands, our own work, uh, whatever that may be, it's not, it's not leadership. Getting and accomplishing goals through a team, that's leadership. And that's a different skill set altogether. Uh, so, I mean, uh, how has uh, the, the leadership uh, role, you know, uh, changed over over the years. What it what is different? What what what, the, what it meant to be a leader like 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago, and what does it mean uh, today? Right, great question. Well, just a few hundred years ago, the entire world was uh, agriculture. Ninety five percent of the jobs were basically farming, and uh, and basically you know life essential kind of things. Uh, there were some specific skills, blacksmiths and, and, and others, but uh, generally speaking, most people were, were farmers and, and lived out in the, uh, in the land. Well, in the Industrial Revolution, that changed and people began to mass move to cities, factories were, were created, and we moved into the Industrial Age. And in that era, for about 180 years, leadership was pretty simple. It was a top-down type of a, uh, approach. Basically, you had bosses, you had employees, and the employees simply did what the bosses told them to do. Things were pretty straightforward, assembly lines, manufacturing, building things, very repetitious. And, and that kind of a leadership approach worked relatively well in the industrial age. Well, when I joined the workforce in 1977-80 uh, timeframe, well, we, the world again changed once again and moved into what we call now the information age. And suddenly now it's, it's the, that leadership model and management model of the past uh, doesn't work very well. You know, it used to be uh, the leader was a was like a cop. You know, he patrolled and he enforced the rules. That was his job. 
Whereas in, in a leadership now in the information age, as we talk about leading teams, innovative teams, it's all about being a coach. And I think everyone can understand the metaphor, uh, leadership metaphor of a coach on a soccer team, right? Uh, a coach is not the fastest runner. He's not the best goalie. Uh, his, jo his job and role is, is very different, very distinct. And it is basically recruiting the very best talent and making sure the right people with the very best talent on the right places doing the very, very best that they can and making sure that the team as a whole is functioning optimally. Okay, so every coach realizes no individual superstar is going to win the, 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 the game or, or the tournament. It's going to be a, a group of players working together in harmony as a team, releasing innovation, releasing creativity. And when you release the power of that team, you, you, win, you win games. And that's true in soccer. It's true in business. It's going to be true in every single one of the disciplines that are listening to me speak today, whether you're in finance or whether you go into uh, the medical field as a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, a businessman, uh, or a politician, whatever it is that you do, uh, these principles of leadership will apply to you in the information age. So uh, I would like to just uh, go a little bit back, uh, you know, to your experience, everything that you went through the U.S. Air Force, maybe just a little bit. If you can share with us, you know, some of your experiences, what was it like, you know, just to, to get a sense of feeling of how does leadership work in the military? Well, the, the military is is uh, has a very well defined um, pipeline, if I can say, you know, you enter in a, as a young person, young soldier, young airman or, or a seaman or whatever the field may be. Um, and you basically start from the bottom and, you know, and you work your way through and, it, and the system is very well designed to develop you so that you get the right experiences and the right education at the right time. So that if you have the potential for greater responsibility and promotion that that's afforded to you. So when I started off as a as a as an airman, uh, that kind of career path for the next 25, 30 years was pretty laid out for me in terms of what does it take to go from a from an airman and get promoted to the next rank. I went then became an officer after eight years I and was uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant. And so it's fairly well defined. What does it take to become a captain, and then from a captain to be promoted to a major, and from a major to a lieutenant colonel, and on. And, and the key to that is, is doing the very best job uh, that you can where you're at. So it don't worry and focus so much on your future because your future is going to be determined by what you do today. If you do an excellent job today, you know, your future will take care of itself. I promise you, you will be promoted in due time. Uh, and and that, I was told that as a young officer, you know, it's it great leadership um, and wisdom and uh, counsel that I received that I took to heart. So as a part of a team, what you want to do is you want to do everything in your power to make that team succeed. And whoever your team leader is, you want to make your team leader succeed. That's where you start. The greatest leaders that there are, has ever been first started as the greatest followers. So learn to be a great follower, great dependable, innovative, creative, always supportive, always building up the team rather than being selfish, self-centered, self-focused. How do I get promoted? What's best for me? That's the opposite of, of, of being a good leader. So a good, a, a good follower. So to be a good follower, you have to really, really put your whole heart into, into making the team succeed, making your team leader succeed. And I promise you, you do that. And now tomorrow, the, tomorrow will take care of itself. You'll be promoted in due time. And then you'll see what it's like to have people working for you and your team, you know, and what you look for in followers, right? You're not, you're not looking for people that are causing trouble and causing strife and have poor relational skills and are always causing conflict and they're more trouble than they're worth. You know, you're going to be looking for the same kind of followers that hopefully you were uh, in the beginning. Uh, so uh, you were talking a little bit about, you know, the skills and stuff that you need uh to be a leader so if we can focus a little bit more about that so what are some uh specific skills or a skill set that great leaders possess in order to lead teams uh, in the best possible way well in the industrial age which some of the thinking in our schools and universities is still still prevalent today it was all about iq it was all about your test scores and the highest test scores got the best opportunities uh, and they were placed in the, in the best positions. And, and uh, if that worked in the industrial age, which I question whether it did or not, it certainly does not work in the information age. Today, more important than IQ and your ability to take tests and retain information, 
uh, is EQ, is your relational skills, your ability to work in a team, your ability to relate to people, your ability to listen well and to resolve conflicts quickly. So the kind of leadership skills that, that are going to get you promoted in your uh, career path over the next 20, 30, 40 years are going to be EQ skills, relational skills, uh, learning to understand people, learning to understand uh, how the differences between individuals and their personality and their temperament and their gender and their backgrounds and experiences to harmonize these people to work together uh, in a team. Because if not, these strong-willed people will tend to clash. And what we don't want is clashing. We want we want people to celebrate the differences, appreciate the differences, and, and allow those differences to work together to create innovation and creativity. So, so relational skills, computer skills, language skills, this is the, these are the important skill sets in the, in the uh, information age. I'm speaking in English to uh, undoubtedly um, a majority of Croatian students, right? And you guys already are demonstrating the fact, I mean, you're listening to me in English. So you're already multilingual and uh, you're, you're in a program such as this, which tells me you, you're beginning already to understand the importance of this kind of education, which, which goes uh, beyond and is quite different than traditional high school, college training, where it's all about IQ, right? It's all about, you know, you learning information that you'll probably never use again in the rest of your life. Whereas in this is more about practical wisdom and the application of principles that are going to uh, shape the way you think and are going to shape your destiny as you move forward in your career. So, I mean, you mentioned before uh, that we're all different. Uh, we have different personality profiles. Uh, we act, uh, you know, differently. We have different backgrounds. Uh, why, from the perspective of leadership, why is it important to understand those uh, personality profiles? Uh, what types are there in general? And, you know, how can uh, a leader serve your future leader, team leaders benefit from knowing that stuff? So one of the very first leadership schools that I went to as a young airman, uh, maybe two years or so in the Air Force, and it was basically a one week, five day leadership course. So they start, they, they give you the right leadership at the right training at the time. It started with a week. Later on, a few years later, it was a month. And then, you know, they, the schools get longer, you know, but the first one I went to was, uh, it was a week. And, and one of the principles they taught us in the very first week was the idea of the different personality profiles and how different people are in innately their their innate personality differences and it goes all the way back to the greeks and romans who understood these things and you know hot blood and cold blood and they didn't understand the biology but they saw that there's different personality temperaments and that people are very different and i listened to that and i can remember as a young guy you know 18 19 i thought to myself you know what that is a bunch of nonsense i don't believe that at all people are far too complex for that kind of you know and it was several years later, actually, after I became an officer, um, I was, I think, 28 years old, if I remember right. And someone came to me in a meeting after a staff meeting uh, and that I was leading and basically said something to me that changed my life. He says, you know what? He says, you are a monster. You know, and I thought to myself, what in the world is this person saying and thinking? You know, and I began to really from that moment on ponder why what was it about me that caused this personality to see me that way? And I began to revisit some of these ideas of the personality. And I started taking these DISC tests and other tests, uh, tests once again, but this time with an open mind, with an open heart. And I began to realize that these, uh, these, these profiles are very helpful. They're all not all inclusive. They are not 100%, but they are one aspect of many that do provide very predictive uh, insights as to how I am, how I think, how I react and respond in situations and in relationships be it marriage or be it at work or be it friendships and how others do. And so with that kind of a predictive model, that is a incredibly important EQ relational skill set. And I can basically ask uh, somebody, I, I was, I had uh, dinner with a CEO and his wife lunch actually was coffee. And we were talking about this topic came up, you know, and I said, you know what? I said, I can ask you two, two questions. And the way you ask those two, answer those two questions, I can tell you an enormous amount about you, your leadership, your marriage, how you relate to each other, your strengths, your weaknesses, your team, how your team sees you. And they laughed. They said, that's that's a joke. And that, that was kind of like me reflecting back to my first leadership training course, right? I said, ah, this is a joke. This is a war. And so I asked them two questions. Number one, are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? And they answered the question I already kind of knew uh, just by listening to them. 
And then a second question is, are you goal oriented, task oriented, or are you people oriented? And they both answered those two questions. And I just, for the next 30 minutes, just began telling them about themselves, their marriages, their strengths, their weaknesses. And they just laughed and had a hilarious time because they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe how much insight I had uh, concerning them. So you can see how important that kind of a predictive skill is as a follower, understanding others and yourself, uh, and as well as being for them becoming a leader, you know, and, and you yeah. begin to celebrate these differences rather than seeing them as, as negative. Uh, could we go back to those two questions? Why is it so easy? Why can you predict uh, all those things just by answering those two questions? Because basically, if you have a person who is an extrovert and they're goal oriented, they fall into, if you picture a, a profile, a four quadrant four profile, right? So you, you know, uh, extrovert, introvert, task oriented, goal oriented, and those create four quadrants, and if you will, right? And those four quadrants define these four personalities. So a extrovert who is goal oriented is going to have a very predictable set of strengths and weaknesses, limitations. They're gonna be visionary. They're gonna be goal oriented. They're gonna be decisive. Uh, but the weaknesses, uh, the limitations, how they're perceived by others is that they can look like they are not confident, but arrogant. They can, they can seem not just decisive, but uh, to uh, be, uh, make decisions too quickly, knee-jerk kind of decisions, right? Without thinking things through. They see things as too easy to be done. And others say, no, it's not that easy. And so there's great strengths and there's great limitations. So, uh, so a D would be somebody I would want on a battlefield. If I'm fighting a battle, I'm gonna, I'm gonna want a commander who, who is that kind of a personality, can get the job done, right? Mission first. So if somebody is an extrovert, and they are a people-oriented person. These are the life of the party. These are the people that are fun, that are engaging because they're, they're, they're not worried about the goal, they're worried about the journey. And they have a very predictable set of uh, strengths uh, and limitations. And so as a leader, you, know, you have to be able to understand and discern these strengths and limitations so you can manage the strengths and, and manage the limitations, especially within a team setting. Uh, most people fall in the uh, introvert and uh, uh, people oriented, they're steadies, they're phlegmatic is another word that's used for that quadrant. They're phlegmatic, easygoing, hardworking, stable. Uh, but their limitation is, is that they, they like security. They're very security oriented. They don't like change, you know, and they especially don't like change that they perceive to be quick or abrupt uh, or without a purpose. Then you have your introverts who are goal oriented. These are the analytical personalities. These are, these guys are the wonderful, these are the people that I would put in jobs in finance, managing numbers, programming uh, uh, software. You know, they're, 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 they're wonderful at that. But their limitation is, is that they tend to be cautious. They tend to be negative. They could be perceived to be negative. You know, so, so these are, these are very predictable quadrants, very predictable, uh, um, things that one can learn. And so when I really purposed myself at 28 to learn this, I started with myself and my marriage, and then I began to apply it to my relationships and friendships. And then, you know, eventually to my leadership. And, and it had a profound effect, uh, I believe, on, on making me a more effective leader. Uh, one important part of, you know, every leader, and uh, we talked about this just a little bit, uh, is attracting the best talent. So you want to surround yourself with people uh, that maybe can, you know, uh, have complementary skills, knowledges, perspectives that can form a great a team. How do great leaders attract the best talent? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and basically what we look for is we look for, first of all, the very best of the best in what, in what the skill or what the, the job is, what the task is, be it finance, be it engineering, be it uh, scheduling, be it uh, marketing or HR, whatever it may be, right? We want to, first of all, find the very best that we can find. And then we want to build a balanced team. You know, we want the right kind of balance between these personality profiles that I've been alluding to. Uh, men and women see things very differently. I would want a balanced team between men and women. I want some older senior people and I want to introduce some younger people that can be developed and groomed as I think more long-term, uh, who are the leaders, next generation leaders that we need to be investing in today so that they're ready tomorrow. And these are all factors that I, I bring into consideration. And basically the job of a leader uh, as a coach is to find the very best talent, right? And you pay that talent. So this kind of industrial age model of let's get the, let's get whoever and pay them as little as we can possibly pay them. Uh, that, that is not a, a, a wise model. I will pay talent and I will pay them what they're worth for several reasons. Number one, the, what will, we will ultimately achieve as a high performance team will far outweigh any of these 
nominal costs, you know, associated with wages and benefits. And the second uh, thing is, is that we want people to stay. We want talented people to stay. And, the re and unfortunately, uh, in the, not unfortunately, the reality of the matter is in the industrial age, and for the young people I'm speaking to today, you're not going to probably get one job when you graduate school, college, and then be in the same job for the next 30, 40 years, retire with a pension. Okay, those days are gone. You'll probably be changing jobs five to 10 times uh, in the next uh, several decades during the course of your career. And so uh, when I find talented people, I don't want them, to, I don't want to lose them. I want to keep them. And so compensating them appropriately and making sure that they're happy, uh, that uh, most people leave jobs because of relationships. They're not happy with their boss. They're not happy with their employees. And so I want to create an environment that is innovative, creative, where people like their job, they like themselves, they like their team, and they like their coach. That's the kind of a winning recipe that is going to make an impact in whatever field or industry uh, that we're that you guys engage in. So once you attract the best talent, you form some sort of team. Uh, is there some you know uh, activities or stuff that you can do? as a leader to empower that, that team in order to you know, engage them even more and to, to, to uh, achieve great things and great goals. Right, so, so the, word, the word that was pretty popular through the 90s and, and 2000s and the, in the, as the industrial age began, uh, excuse me, information age began to under, try to un understand what was happening, you know, with the Steve Jobs and the, and the Gates and the, and the, you know, the computer revolution and, and uh, Toyota in, in, in Japan and all of these you know, industry was, was being revolutionized by a new, uh, new leadership management uh, model. And so uh, academics began to start to study this and try to write books to explain this. And, the term that was used uh, probably more than any other term was the term empowerment. How does a leader empower his team? Uh, well, in the military, the word is delegation. How do you delegate? You know, And of course, that is a science as well as it is a, a skill set. It has to be done wisely. You can't just delegate and say, okay, go for it. Run, run with it. You, know, you have to responsibly empower people. And what you do is you give them clear tasks and you help them, you train them, you encourage them, like what a coach does, right? A coach is constantly developing the players. Part of that is by discipline, part of that is by setting high standards and high expectations. Part of that is, is uh, in, you know, uh, ensuring that they're, that they're trained and, you know, part of that is encouragement uh, and letting them run with it. So what I did in the military as I began to apply these principles is I would gather together, you know, again, I would recruit the very best, smartest, uh, I was in logistics and we were re, uh, re, refurbishing aircraft, B-52, C-5s, aircraft, et cetera. And so I went right down to the, to, the, to the floor where people are actually doing the work. If you want to know what's really going on in any organization, you go down and actually talk to the people that are actually doing the work. They know what the problems are and they probably have the best ideas of what the solutions are. And then from there, every layer of management information is being filtered so that when it gets up to higher levels of leadership, the accuracy of that information becomes is diminishes. It becomes less and less. Uh, so the further up you are in an organization, you could be sure that you're being lied to, or, or you know, you're not being told all the facts, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So what a wise leader does is he goes down there and he actually he mingles with the actual people and talks to the actual people and builds relationship with the actual people doing the work. And you ask them what they think, and you sometimes get a completely different story. So what I began to do is I began to pull together the best scheduler I can find, the best production person I can find, the best engineer, the best planner, the best material person. And I would pull these people together and I would get them to innovate. I said, okay, you guys define the problems and come up with solutions. And I'm going to use my position, my authority, my rank to help implement your ideas, which otherwise would have never have been listened to, much less implemented, right? These people were had the mindset that they were powerless, that they had no voice, no say. And the reality of the matter is in that model, that industrial age model, that's absolutely true. No one's paying them to give their opinion, right? They're being paid, do your job and shut up and don't make trouble. That was the mindset. Well, the new model is completely opposite. It's not only do I not want you to shut up and do your job, I want you to help change the world, okay? And I'm gonna empower you to, to do that. You, you've got the best insights, you know the problems, you know the solutions, and I'm not gonna use my authority not to lord over you, but to actually empower you, and in fact, to serve you, because as you excel, as the team excels, 
I, as a leader, will benefit and the entire organization will benefit. So it's the ultimate win-win scenario. But it is a very completely different leadership mon- mindset than what has been traditionally taught in the past. Uh, so, so what about, uh, I mean, that, that obviously works for, you know, organizational perspectives and stuff like that. Uh, let's say for small teams that are actually just, you know, starting. Uh, you know, where to start? Maybe you don't even know who the team leader is. So, you know, how, how does the, the process look like? How do you decide? How do you engage? How do you follow, respect? Uh, especially, you know, if your colleagues and you perceive, you know, maybe to be better at some things, you know, what do you need to get the ball rolling? Well, for one thing is, is take, take initiative. Don't, don't wait for someone else to, to, to tell you what to do or to lead or to take initiative. If there's no one else taking initiative, then you take initiative, right? Uh, use whatever influence you have and, and, and step out, you know, uh, use it. You know? So in other words, uh, as a part of a, of a, of a team, uh, I would come up and see possibilities or see opportunities. And I didn't have the, the authority per se myself, So I would go to my boss and say, hey, this is what I see. This is what I would like to do. Would you uh, uh, empower me or allow me to pull together a team and to try something, to do something new, to, you know, to innovate? And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, we'll learn from that and we'll we'll move on. So uh, rather than waiting for your, your leader to come to you and tell you what to do, innovate. Look at what can be done. What are the possibilities? How can I solve my boss's problems? And then you take the initiative. You know, you go to your boss and make recommendations. And, and I tell you, most leaders are, will be thrilled with that. You know, some are insecure. You'll be de- you will deal with some insecure leaders in the course of your career. And those are tough. Just wait it through because they'll, they'll eventually go. They come and go. But, but most leaders, when they, when they have someone come to them in a team with a great idea or a good idea, and they want to try it and they want to take some initiative, most leaders will be thrilled with that. You know, so what I did in my experience, very rarely did I have my boss come to me and say, go fix that particular problem. You know, I looked for I looked for my boss's problems and then I figured out how to solve them and 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 uh, and just went out and just did it. I didn't ask for permission. You know, Uh, sometimes I had to ask for an apology. But as we heard it said, right, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So you got to walk that fine balance. Sometimes that can be a little risky. You need wisdom. But more times than not, that has much paid off for me in my experience. Taking initiative uh, drew um, good results. And as a result, that paved the way for favor and for promotions down the road. I wasn't doing it for promotion. I wasn't doing it to draw attention to myself. Uh, I was just doing it because I wanted to do the very best job I can. You know, and Yeah, so uh, a lot of you know, uh, young people, when we start... You know, you would like to, you know, uh, take the big position, take responsibility, uh, become a leader without maybe, you know, getting your heads dirty. Does it work that way? Or do you have to first, I don't know, prove yourself, you know, uh, get your hands uh, in the mud and, you know, work your uh, that ass off or stuff like that? Or how does it work? Well, you know, when we look historically, you know, at the kind of... Uh, model of people who are promoted and put, put positions because of their status, uh, their who they know, uh, those systems tend to be inherently flawed. For example, you know, you look at wars throughout Europe over the last many hundreds of years, right? It was the nobility that were in times of war selected to be officers and colonels, and they were taken with no experience whatsoever in putting command of armies just because of their status, you know, in society. And those were, those were always turn out to be disastrous. And I think that applies to business or any other field as well too. The very best leaders I have ever served or worked with over my 30, 40 years have been those who have started at the bottom and they worked their way up and, and they, they were competent and experienced and, and, and those are the kind of leaders that people wanna follow. You know, they wanna, they wanna follow someone that they can believe in. And that's part of how you build clout is, you know, those who've been there, done that, uh, experienced that. So it, it turned out that my eight years as an aircraft mechanic, as an enlisted guy, proved quite well later on when I was a commissioned officer. Because when I went down and started speaking to the first level guys doing the job, working on the aircraft or whatever, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, and I, you know, I, they, they found out I was a mechanic too. I was one of them. You know, I've been there, done that. Uh, I had an, a federal FAA certified aircraft power plant license, and I had, you know, a degree in aircraft in, in aeronautics, and so my experience, my background, all of that uh, result resulted in um, in a clout and an influence uh, 
as a leader that uh, that you don't get even your rank doesn't matter what your rank is you, know, you you don't get that kind of respect from rank you get that kind of respect because of who you are because of your experience what you've done and uh, and so those are the kind of leaders uh, that uh, that uh, you want to you want to be down the road long term you know don't look at those short term you know benefits of climbing over somebody else uh, it's the long term that you want to look the long game as we say that you want to be considering uh, so basically, every team uh, needs to be excellent. You know, every individual needs to provide certain level of excellence in order for the entire uh, team to succeed. So, what does it actually mean to be excellent, and how can you know we all, uh, as leaders or future leaders, facilitate that culture of excellence with every single individual in our team? Right. So that was another thing the academics tried to wrap their head around as they were looking at this you know, explosion in the 1990s and 2000s. And several books were written. Very one of the most famous books that was written was In Search of Excellence, still a classic to this day. And I would encourage uh, you young guys and gals to to read some of those those kind of books, some of these classics that will never grow old. The principles will be forever. But in the pursuit of excellence, there was an attempt to look at various different industries and to see what that looks like. What does excellence look like in business or in manufacturing or uh, in uh, computer science or whatever it may be? And, and, and you'll start to see some of the attributes that come out of that, largely EQ skills more so than IQ. Uh, type of related skills, but exceeding the expectation of your customer would be an example uh, of that. So in the information age, the idea is, is that you want whatever you're in, whatever you're innovating, whatever field you're in, you want to make, you want to do three things in, and it boils down to quicker, better, and cheaper. Okay. Quicker, right. Performance, better speaks of quality and cheaper speaks of, of value. Right. So whatever it is, it doesn't matter if it's information management, insurance business uh, or it's um, uh, uh, manufacturing or whatever it may be. Right. The goal is you want performance, you want quality, you want uh, cost. And, and those that can do those three things better than their competitor are going to ex excel. Right. I'm looking at a computer right now. It's about three, four years old. I'm very happy with it. But when I buy a new computer, right, I'm not going to look for and buy a new computer four years after I bought this one and look for something that's that's not as quality, uh, not more expensive and doesn't work as well. It has less RAM and less, right? I'm looking for something that's going to be quicker and better and faster, right? And I expect to pay the same, maybe a little bit more, but I expect to pay the same, maybe even a little less. And what I will get is actually better and faster and cheaper than what I bought before. Okay. That's the, that's the information age in which we live, right? And so innovation and creativity is what is going to achieve that constant uh, progression forward in terms of excellence. So whatever you do, right, make it excellent, make it cheaper, better, faster, and you are going to be riding the wave into the future. When I was a young guy, the first heart surgeon, the first heart replacement took place, and it was done, I think, over 24 years hours of surgery and it never been done before, right? And in my lifetime, just a generation later, they do thousands, 5,000 heart replacements a day, right? And they do it in about six hours, right? That's excellence, right? That's taking something and making it excellent, right? Improving it, making it better, faster, and cheaper. So kind of make that your mindset when you, when you think about excellence. So, uh, you know, a lot of uh, these students are going to be engaged uh, in innovation, uh, I mean, they've uh, went through change, through disruption, through innovation, uh, almost uh, two crises or uh, at least two crises uh, in their lifetime. So uh, we have a world that's constantly changing uh, and, you know, in, in every single segment of our life. So if you are a leader, how do you lead your team in, in the face of change with all that ambiguity, uncertainty, uh, risk? What do you do? Right. That's a good question. So one of the attributes of leaders, I mean, you know, the young people, you guys are not going to start off, to be honest with you, few of you are going to start off as leaders. You don't have the experience, right? And, and you're going to be serving. You're going to be a part of the team. And as I said, be the very best team, mate, team player you can possibly be. But as you develop, eventually, you will become leaders, many of you. 
And leaders, part of another attribute of a leader beyond what we've already said, and that's the ability to look forward, look into the future, look over the horizon where others cannot see what is coming. An effective leader is always attempting to look over the horizon to see what is coming next. And the way you practically do that is you look at what are the other innovators in your particular field, whatever that may be. Again, finance, manufacturing, car sales, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Who are the very best in the, in the world that are doing, that are in the same field, that are already doing what you're doing? And look for those who are leading the way. Look for those key uh, innovators and those key companies and organizations that are already at the top of the game. Because what you want to do is you don't want to start all over again, right? You want to start, if you can, where they're at, right? Learn all you can learn from them. And then, and then you will be that much ahead of absolutely everybody else. So that the term for that is in the 90s and 2000s was called benchmarking, right? You benchmark against the very best person, right? If I, if I run a McDonald's, right, and, and, and the Burger King is, is outselling me and out doing everything better than me, right? I'm going to go and study Burger King very carefully so that I can learn from them and benchmark against them so that I don't spend days, weeks, years uh, learning the basic things that I can learn very quickly if I benchmark. So, right, so, so what I did as a, as a young officer, and I learned this principle, I began taking my teams and we, I took them to uh, a manufacturing uh, F-16 fighter jet manufacturing plant in, in Dallas, Texas. I took them to, at that time, the most uh, effective, uh, amazing uh, smartphones of, uh, were, were by Motorola. I took my, my team to Motorola and asked for a tour. And I met with their leaders and sat down and we, our team asked questions. How did you build an innovative team? Right. Uh, I took them actually to a coffee shop, which was a coffee factory that produced coffee. Right. And so these were these were I was benchmarking against industries that were actually not necessarily even within my specific specific sphere. But these were innovative teams and we benchmark and we learn from them. We learn what they why did they think differently? Why, what did they learn? What can we apply? What can we learn from them? Right. And that's what an effective leader. If you want to be at the top of the game for the rest of your career. That's what you have to do. Look over the horizon and always be looking for who you can benchmark against, right? Who can you learn? And what I do then is I would send my teammates, my team players to these different places sometimes. I didn't, me go or my team go, if it was specialized in the area of um, HR or in the area of computer programming or in the area of manufacturing or uh, parts or supplies, supply chains, right? I would send my people to these places and benchmark and have them benchmark and learn and then come back to our team with a fresh new perspective on what we can do. So, uh, I mean, when you're doing an innovation, when you're facing change, there's obviously a lot of stress, a lot of uh, fear of the unknown. Uh, as a leader, how, how do you approach that? So how can you be, you know, feel, make your teammates feel uh, secure and not, you know, to overthink about stuff that they can't control, but more focus on stuff? That they can do moving forward. Right. And again, I think that's another, another aspect of good leadership. A good leader can, can, can get, uh, gander not only respect for the leader, but, but what we would call in the French esprit de corps, right? A spirit of teamwork, a spirit of a team. So think about a, a good, good coach, a quality coach, a great coach, what he does in his team. He, he gets the team, first of all, to believe in him. And then secondly, he does, he gets the team to believe in themselves. Because a team that doesn't believe that can win will never win. A team that believes they can win will win eventually, right? And so, so a spirit of core and, and teamwork and that kind of a belief in oneself and believing in the team and believing in the team leader is critical. And that's a skill set that, that is, again, you're not born with that. You learn that. You learn how to do that well. And I would add to that that another part of, 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 uh, of, of what you're uh, asking is it would be to, to look for small wins. Don't look for, you know, huge wins. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the small wins, right, that build momentum. And so the way you build momentum is you get the team to, to win a few, right? And they don't have to be big wins, but little wins consistent over time produce big wins, right? In a baseball metaphor, you might not know more baseball, but, you know, I, I don't want my team to be focused on, on striking home runs every time they come to the bat. I want consistent base hits, right? And it's a consistent base hits over time that makes the winning team. Not someone that can occasionally hit a home run. Uh, that's not going to win the game, right? So uh, you'll have those home run moments where something explosive happens, 
but generally speaking, your career is going to look like a lot of consistent little wins over time. And the terminology for that in the 90s and 2000s, again, was continuous process improvement. Okay, So you can find lots of books and articles that's related. That's the topic. That's the subject that you are looking for continuous process improvement. How, what does that mean? What does that look like? And when, when you get your team to think that way, uh, that, takes, that takes away a lot of the, the anxieties and problems because you're, you're not overperforming. You're not trying to accomplish the impossible. Goals that are not realistic do not motivate, they demotivate. So we want goals that are consistent, obtainable, and as you probably teach, SMART goals, right? Uh, they're specific, they're measurable, and that's what a team leader wants to do is put out those smart goals for people and manage those expectations so that they're realistic. So uh, do you have any uh, last remark or, you know, uh, concluding remarks or messages that you want to uh, provide with uh, students across Croatia? Absolutely. Um, looking back, if I was to share one, one insight now that I'm in my 60s and have gone through a, a career, and, uh, and watched thousands of others go through a career, I mean, not just myself, but all those that I started with, those that were before me, the, now as I look back and try to teach and mentor those that are behind me, the reality of the matter is this, you are all going to enter the workplace, the marketplace, uh, and in 30 or 40 years, you will exit the market in the, in the place, right? So, so you need to be thinking long-term, right? And, and, and as you go through your career, what's going to happen is, is the people that are in front of you, ahead of you now, are going to retire or die. So that in 30, 40 years, you are going to be at a place where you're at the top of your game. You are at the top of your career field, whatever that may be. Because everyone that has gone before you will have had to retire. Many of them will have to die. We all get old, right? And so the, my point is, is that these opportunities, it's not, will they afford themselves? I'm telling you, I guarantee you, they will afford themselves. The only question is, will you be at the right place at the right time with the right skill set? That's the questions that you need to ask because your, your opportunity will come. You, you will be at the top of your game, the senior person in whatever it is that you do or one of the senior people in whatever it is that you do. And the question at that point is, is what have you done for the last 30 or 40 years? Have you accumulated the character? Have you developed the skill sets? Have you acquired the knowledge have you developed as a leader, right? So that when the opportunity for promotion comes into the most influential positions, you are the person that will stand out. And I can tell you being at the Pentagon, hiring colonels and hiring the very, very top, top of the top uh, in, in, the, in Air Force Logistics, which was security forces, civil engineering, uh, aircraft maintainers, uh, you know, all of the supply chain, I mean, just all of that. At the very, very top, we were hiring the top leaders uh, and and I, I saw what that looked like. I sat on those promotion boards. And I can tell you, it's not like you're looking out over a sea of a thousand people that you have to pick from. It, it boils down to just one or two people, one, two, three people that stand out from amongst the rest. And so it's actually not hard to pick those leaders down the road 30 years from now. The only question is, will you be the one that stands out or will you just be one of the me mediocre thousands that that are just like everybody else, you know, the, the, the color of mil uh, white, mil uh, Manila or whatever color that is, right? You know, so stand out, you know, and your, your experiences, your background, your, your accomplishments are going to speak volumes uh, down the road and, uh, and live every day, one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself, right? Do the very best job you can do today. Continue learning, continue growing. Continue adding to your repertoire and to your your resume uh, that skill set. Uh, uh, you know, when I when I was 28 years old, I could have went on for a ma my master's degree in logistics. I chose to to go into counseling and people skills because I realized how important e um, relational skills were. And and so I went into a completely different field than for my master's degree because I wanted to grow in that area. I was a D. I'm an extrovert, goal oriented, uh, not by nature a people oriented person. And I realized that I need to really, really develop in that area. So, so great leaders have got great self-awareness. They, they learn what they're good at. They realize what they're not good at. They soar with their strengths. They learn to manage their weaknesses. And, and you do that, you will do well. You will never be in want of a job. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for all those uh, uh, great words, for all your uh, wisdom and motivation. Uh, it was a real pleasure uh, talking and discussing with you. 
and uh, hope we can have this discussion live next year here in Croatia. Thank you very much. All right. Greetings to you all, and I wish you all the very best in your careers. Thank you.